Welcome everybody to this latest in the Values Jam guest session series. And today, Peter, it's brilliant to have you with us. So to kick off, please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about the great work that you do. Really great uh, to, to be here, Alan. I am Peter Laughter, and I uh, re recognize that recruiting is absolutely screwed and everyone hates it. And I help companies transform it by telling stories about purpose and values so they can connect with the magnificent people who don't even know that they exist yet. Okay, so, and where, uh, where can people get hold of you? LinkedIn is the best place. Uh, yeah, LinkedIn, uh, uh, Peter Laughter. I don't think there's a lot of laughters on LinkedIn. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I haven't found one Peter Laughter other than me yet. So that's a great place. My website is truebearing.work, W-O-R-K. Yeah. Okay. And just before we start the values jam, I, the, the recruitment process has always fascinated me because it's like you've got the person that wants the job pretending to be something that they think the other person wants. And then the person that wants to hire the best talent pretending to be what they think they want. So it's a totally false environment, right? It, it is a false environment. And not only that, it, uh, yeah, I was so I was an entrepreneur in the recruiting and staffing industry, the last eight years of which I was completely miserable. And it's because we've commoditized the uh, the process of engaging with human beings. Yeah. And, you know, we we're applying this simple process of buying stuff to this immensely complex process of of engaging with other human beings. And in doing so, we're only talking to people who are looking for our specific job in the moment we have to hire. It's a small group of people, but it's also not how we discover our passions. You know, and it's very, very limiting. So what I do is I help companies tell stories that emanate from the narrative themes that come from their values online to create engagement and relationships. And Anyone knows that the best hires they've ever done have come from relationships. The yeah, question is, absolutely. how do you build relationships at scale? And we now have the technology with social media to do that really effectively. So it's a, but our, but our methodologies have really stayed. There's, you know, back in the day when we were sending mailing resumes in because of uh, classified ads, we're just doing a slightly faster version of that. We've created faster caterpillars when we need butterflies. So yeah, so that's a great way to put it. So here's the Values Jam card deck. And what I'm going to do is tip out some cards. And then uh, how many piles would you like me to create in front of me, Peter? Three is my lucky number. So let's go. OK, with let's go with three then. And so starting with my left and working to my right, one, two or three. Three. OK. And I guess are you going to? Uh, well, how many cards are in there in the pile? <laughs> There's more than three. Okay. Uh, nine. nine. Let's go with seven. Yeah. Let's seven. just mix it up with that. That's my wife's favorite number, so I figure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wonder what your wife would think about this. Oh, yes. Responsibility. I love it. All right. So to kick off, what does responsibility mean? And what does it look, feel, and sound like? Wow. Um, so, uh, I am going to take a quick detour. So my, my theme for this year is life is like opening a beautifully wrapped gift that everything that happens happens for me, not to me. Yeah. So that is my theme for the year. And, uh, so responsibility is the perfect card because I think what, what, what that really means for me is taking responsibility for everything that happens. Now, that doesn't mean fault. I think that's a very, very different thing. But I know, you know, if uh, I, if something bad happens to me, just last week, uh, I, my parked car uh, was sideswiped by an ice cream truck uh. Uh, and ruined the, just took out the whole left side of the car. Um, and, um, so is that my fault? Definitely not. But I did have concerns about parking it on that part. It was late at night. It was difficult to find parking. There was a spot where, you know, the, the road narrowed. I thought, is this the best place to park it? Sure enough, I was wrong. So, <laughs> you know, it's not my fault, but it is definitely my responsibility. 
And I think particularly when random bad things happen, it comes taking the uh, uh, frame of responsibility um, of of where. So, for example, I um, have a yeah, if I have a client who's not paying me, um, well, I have responsibility in that. Yeah, you know, and if I own that responsibility, then it really keeps me from having the anger, the frustration because I have agency in that and I can really use that experience. And it is also representational of a commitment that I have, um, you know, that my yeah, upset of, uh, from that. It's not just that they owe me money, but that I had a commitment to do a good job and I did mm -hmm. a good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my upset is, is not just because they're not paying me, but also they're not recognizing the contribution that I made. Um, and, and so I can actually take some pleasure out of that responsibility because it is a reminder that I've done a good job. Yeah. So, right. There's a few things that you've mentioned then. So it, it, it seems to me that you, you take responsibility very seriously and often when people are in that position with a value their expectation of others is quite high so in in that situation with your client how do you deal with that because on the one hand i guess you're asking yourself why is it what can i do in order to get paid but then on the other side of the coin i bet you're thinking well hold on a minute i've done a really good job here the arrangement was that i should get paid for the job that i did and so why, what's, what's the shortfall for? So, I mean, I think uh, the, the shortfall is this particular company in question supposedly has really fallen apart um, after I started working there and they've, they've made some uh, really poor strategic decisions to change their business focus and not when I was consulting with them, one of the things that I saw is like, you don't have a stable income source. You're recreating it at every you know, time. And you have all of these abilities that you can create a, um, you know, a repeatable, replicatable uh, business, uh, you know, replicatable income off of. And they weren't interested in that. Um, and so they made a decision to swing for the fences and they came up short. Um, and so, um, it, and, and I think, so my ability to take responsibility for that action and to recognize it at, for what it is, is very, very important because I would otherwise get lost in being angry and make rash decisions. Yeah. Um, so for example, I decided to uh, take them to court last month. Okay. And and I realized that that was a decision out of anger. Um, and it was premature, premature for a number of different reasons. I wasn't ready. You know, I hadn't really thought about it. I hadn't thought it through about what needs to happen with that. What do I really need with that? Um, you know, uh, to make that happen, um, to, to make the case uh, effective. But also, can I give them a chance to barter uh, you know, for, for this opportunity? Yeah, they don't have the money to pay me. Is there something else that they can do? Now, they have uh, decided not to do that. So I will need to move ahead. But it, it, that space in taking, you know, that taking response my own responsibility and accounting for my own responsibility and appreciating that responsibility, right? I am, you know, I am upset not and recognizing I'm not, I'm upset because they're not paying me and I want my money and that's natural, but I'm also very upset because it is a, uh, it doesn't acknowledge the good work that I've done. Yeah. And, and so, and, and I can now have appreciation for my commitment to doing good work. So it is, you know, and recognize that my anger at that is a, is a direct result of that commitment that I bring to my clients. And so I can let that anger go and think a lot more clearly uh, about this, this difficult situation mm -hmm. and, and forward. And I can also, um, whereas I can 
um, have empathy, I can have empathy for their situation. It is still not my responsibility, nor should it be, yeah, my empathy allow for them not to fulfill their commitment forever. Um, but it uh, allows me to open up and have more of a, um, a, uh, a response that might work. Yeah. yeah. Ah. And and listening to you there when you were talking about how you realize that your initial choice decision was based on anger and wasn't perhaps uh, the way that you'd want things to be done reminds me of somebody I know that um, breaks the word down. So they they refer to your ability to respond or give a response. So response ability. Um, which I, I think is a really smart way of doing it, actually, because, you know, when something happens, you have a choice how you respond. It's your ability. You choose your ability to respond. Um, and I, I've really enjoyed that. I only, only came across that about probably nine months ago or so. That's brilliant. I, I will remember that forever. Yeah. Responsibility. That's yeah. Great. Yeah, and the, and the other thing that you reminded me of is when, when I'm working with individuals um, and they don't know what their values are, one of the exercises that, you know, you can do surveys and you can work with lists and all the rest of it. But one of the things that I find is most fruitful is to ask people to think of times when they've just felt brilliant and everything is in flow because probably one of their core values is in play. And like you've just described, the opposite is also true. So when are you really pissed off or angry or upset? Because it's likely that one of your core values is being trampled on. So tapping into those extremes of emotion is a brilliant way to identify what is really important to you and what is less important. What about the what about the metaphor side of this then? So if we think about responsibility, what image comes to mind or what feeling comes to mind or what sound comes to mind? Um, well, it's really interesting because when I thought about my and I how I set my goals for the years, I find that most of the goals that I've set in my life were punitive. You know, I don't have enough money. I'm too fat. Um, yeah, you know, like this. And so make more money, you know, lose weight. And I was I realized like this sucks. I feel bad about myself all year. And um, so I did something uh, differently the, uh, this year, and it was a two-part exercise, is one, I would imagine, what do I want the, the feeling to be most, or that I want to experience this year most commonly? And then I would go through a process that I would write down all of the complaints that I have about myself, and then do and create the opposite of that. Okay. And look for those experiences. And so when I think of responsibility, and really what I looked at was how, you know, how and what I look if if I were to, and I came across that idea, I want everything that happens to me to be well, I want everything that happens to be recognized as something that happens for me, mm -hmm. not yeah. uh to me. And what would that be like? And it was literally like, oh, that everything that happens is like opening a gift. Like, oh, look at this, even if it's horrible. Well, yeah. um, to say, what is the opportunity that I have in this challenge? And so I think that that is, and particularly, uh, I've been thinking about this a lot over the past uh, several years, is we are at our best on the other side of challenge, right? Yeah, um, we go through a hard time. We're like, whew, I am so much stronger as a result. That sucked, but... I'm a better person. You know, yeah. I have a difficult time with my wife and we work through it. We are stronger as a couple. Yeah. You know, my, my daughter and I have a disagreement about something and we work through it. We, we have a stronger relationship. And so I have that experience consistently, but yet going into difficult times, I'm always bracing myself like, no, 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 you know, stop and avoiding it. And that's where the pain is. And you know, and uh, that it, the pain is is not from uh, accepting uh, the situation; it is from denying it. Is it shouldn't be this way, and that and we've all had that where we've gone through rough times and it's painful and it's hard. And then the moment we say, "Okay, this is what it is, and this is what I need to do," it doesn't mean it's still not painful, but is much 
less painful and there's significant less suffering. And so my question for this year is how do I approach the year where I, I when I am encounter a challenge, it is, and not just the challenges like, well, it'd be really cool to climb that mountain, maybe I'll do it. But those challenges that are, oh crap, I have to climb that mountain in order to get to where I wanna go and it's really steep. Um, those challenges that are presented as obstacles, how can I start to transform that idea as, um, as an opportunity? Like, oh, how great it'll be to be at the other side. And I won't be able to have that experience without that. So what will, what is the opportunity with this challenge? And so it's, it's a, a kind of eerie that responsibility would, would come out because it really is what I'm trying to imagine is, is just that, that opening of, uh, of a gift uh, as opposed to a burden. Uh, which I think is how most people really look at responsibilities. I'm responsible for so much. And I want to be really clear. I get to that place of viewing it as a burden all of the time. But I am able to remember that it is an opportunity. Matter of fact, there was a conversation I had with my wife last night that was just, you know, perfect. I, I am and I'm starting a, a new business um, to transform the recruitment business. And, uh, you know, going into it, I thought, well, I'm a seasoned entrepreneur. This is going to be easy this time. Nope, <laughs> just as hard. And, you know, a man of my age working, you know, 10 hours a day for, you know, six, uh, 10, 12 hours a day working, you know, for six days a week is, is not as, as, as comfortable as it was when I was in my twenties. Um, and I came home and I was just cranky and uh, resentful and I am you know cleaning up after dinner and my wife brings up a, a business thing and I get really angry it's just like can I just get an hour and blah 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 yeah now um now uh, you know and that was totally there but in thinking about it I realized oh I've gotten resentful out of uh this process of working so hard and seeing other people who don't and that's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. My wife said something innocuous, and it was my interpretation you know, that turned it on its yeah. You know, and so, um, you know, did I apologize? Not yet. I'm not quite ready, yeah, you know, for that. But what I did say is clearly I have some issues of resentment that I need to work through. And okay. I want to just acknowledge that. So it 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 and for me, it's rather my wife is no longer the problem. Yeah, it is, it, you know, it is something I need to work out. And that is, that that gives me so much power in my relationship. Yeah, because if she's the problem, well, I got to fix her. And we've all tried that and it doesn't work. But if it's, if it's my responsibility to look at my interpretation, then I have agency. And that is, and I don't need to vilify my wife, which also sucks. So yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great way to look at it. And um, what we're touching on here as well, I think, is <clears throat> moving, you know, when you were talking about your car and the ice cream um, truck or van or whatever you call it. Oh, it was a truck. That, yeah. that's, a, that's about things, right? Whereas responsibility, when it starts to touch other people, becomes a whole different ball game. And like you've talked about your wife, and then I'm. you've reminded me of a situation in leadership roles in organizations and I always used to tell my team leader level guys that yes as a leader they had responsibility and like you say it's pretty easy to regard that as a bit of a burden and something that you've got to carry but I asked them to consider also what a wonderful privilege they had because imagine so I'm, I'm thinking actually of a, a guy who I used to be in the hospitality sector he was the head chef, had a team of 20 odd people, and he was explaining how he felt this sense of responsibility for his team. And I didn't kind of deny that you have responsibility because yeah. that, that's not right, you do. Um, but I, I went on to explain to him that he's got 21 guys there that he could actually shape the career of in the future, in the longer term. And then even in the short term, the mood they go home with, oh. he influences, right? So if you've got the chance to make somebody go home and be regarded by their family as in a brilliant mood because they've had a wonderful day, how cool is that? So it's this 
balance between, you know, not denying the responsibility because it's definitely there, but balancing it with this sense of privilege and really making the most of that. Yeah, that that is that, and 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 the, the the huge ripple effects that that example brings. I'm thinking of the there was a cartoon from the 1950s that I remember seeing of uh, a man being yelled at work. It was you know very sexist, but uh, uh, being yelled at work and coming home and yelling at his wife and his wife yelling at their son and their son yelling at the dog. And it was just this you know one thing sets this chain, but and that. The four frames of that comic extend so farther, you know, and you know, so just that experience of being able to have people leave the uh, workplace feeling proud of the work they do and knowing that they're part of a team that has their back has ripple effects that we cannot even conceptualize. And it is, it, you're right, it is a complete privilege. Yeah. And, and the truth of the matter is, is we have no conceptualization of the impact that we have on other human beings. Yeah, it's that. Um, and I think this is you, you'll know this better than me, but uh, it seems to me that when I was coming through my career, there was a really strong divide between your work and your home life, uh, whereas now it's becoming a lot more blurred. And so perhaps that's a good thing because people are going to recognize that it's not about how you perform at work and then when you leave the building that's it job done you're still you're still going to have an impact thereafter well, Alan, I actually think that that is one of the defining moments of this time what you've just mentioned so I really hold that the what is it's not that that something has shifted between the separation of work and life, and one of one of the things that I really dislike is that phrase "work-life balance," because it connotates that when we go to work, we just shut our life off. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, we come back at the end of the day, and our life is turned back on. That's not the way it happens at all. It's just life, and so I think now, and I think we were beginning. I really saw this at the end of the financial crisis, where I saw people were like looking at, like, wait a second. I'm busting my butt for a job I don't particularly like, like to make money so I can pay for things that I really can't afford and don't really want. And I thought, oh, everything's going to change. And it didn't, but it was it, it was the beginning of that. And I think that the pandemic really accelerated that sense was we were, yeah. were all at home. We saw so much death, particularly here in America. We just saw so much upheaval after the murder of George Floyd. Yeah, where uh, where people just said, "What am I doing? Yeah, what well, this is this is not worth it." And yeah. and if you look at that, I mean, a one, uh, sorry, six in ten people in the workplace have quietly quit. Yeah, they're doing just the bare minimum to get yeah. by, yeah. and that is so depressing. I actually don't think that it is a huge increase. I think that there has been, if you look at the Gallup st studies that. People have been disengaged at work about, you know, up and down about 70 percent, uh, close to 80 percent of the workplace is on the spectrum of disengaged. But I think now it is just more pronounced, I think. So I think where there's not a greater percentage of people who are uh, disengaged, I think they're more expressive about it. And, yeah. and going back to your comment about COVID, I think that COVID was a real wake up call for so many people because it kind of either forced or gave the space for that self-reflection and I think people rather than just being mind-numbingly going through the process of getting on the subway in the morning and getting into the office and spending the hours and then just going home it was more about well hold on a minute is this what I really want for my life and for my family and and then so taking personal responsibility actually um and I, I think like you say a lot of people have made some interesting choices you know I've known people that have moved jobs left jobs with no job to go to uh, made the choice to retire because they don't they don't see um, it fulfillment in the the job that they do anymore, and that all of those cases were driven by people asking the question, "What do I really want now?" Uh, caused by the, the the impact of the pandemic. 
Mm, okay, let's let's move on to an, another if, question. If I can just so, add on to that with the theme of responsibility, and I think that's one of the things that corporations have not acknowledged. So you'll hear, oh, people are lazy, they don't want to work anymore. You know, not true, you know, and, and what they're missing out on that, that same dynamic by not taking responsibility that the world has changed, they're missing out on the immense opportunity that there is. And yeah, I am thinking uh, a couple of days ago, uh, Business Insider published an article about Goldman Sachs. That is, we you know that they're really floundering right now, that there is like one of the few investment banks that have missed their earnings, um, you know, and that they've They've slipped. Now, Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs, now they were a client of mine when I was in the recruiting and staffing industry. So I know them well. Um, and out of all the investment banks, they did the best to really focus on purpose uh, and culture. They were the closest to that. They had this innate sense of what they were doing, but they got lost in making money for money's sake. Money is a tool. It is like oxygen to us. You know, it, but it is not, we do not exist to consume greater quantities of oxygen. Oxygen, we live for a higher purpose and our companies need to as much. And so, you know, in uh, the early 2000s, Goldman Sachs had, or the mid 2000s, had a great advertising campaign about the power of finance. What could be possible? This company was able to grow and support their community. This organization was able to innovate. And so they talked about that, but it was just in an advertising campaign. They didn't bring it to the organization. And so now when Goldman was known for being killers and cutthroat, they're recognizing that no longer works. So they pivoted to being nicer and they've just become a shadow of themselves. Now with purpose, there is nothing wrong with having a killer instinct. Yeah, you know, so, there is absolutely nothing wrong if it serves your purpose, right? And I think that's very important. Having a cutthroat culture, there's there, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there is a type of person who really excels in that, yeah. you know, environment. If the Navy SEALs, you know, can have thousands of people who try and jo join that organization for Hell Week, which I mean, just the name of it. No, no, thank you. I mean, I do not want to spend a week where I am exercising for 20 hours a day, ever. Yeah, but there are people who love that. And they 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 will they try time and time again to get into that is because they agree with the purpose uh, and the culture of that organization. So you want to tell me that Goldman friggin' Sachs can't accomplish that? No, but they missed the boat. They didn't focus on their purpose. They didn't identify it and they didn't lean into it. And, and, and the examples of that are all over the place. And I think that is the, the, we have this time where people are hungry for meaning. Great. Our corporations need to provide it. And so, um, so I think that that's a really important point. And one of the things that I am really focused on with my company, how do we recognize those things and tell stories about them to attract the people who are are lit up by those purpose and value that purpose and the values that lead to that purpose and i yeah so i think it's a transformative time where mm. people are just demand for that where before it was just some nice things to put on the wall yeah i'm i'm loving what you're talking about here and there's again i think there's probably two or three things that i want to touch on so First, you and I are similar in that, you know, we've you, what you said was being cutthroat is absolutely fine. Um, some people that operate in the value space, I find they try and pretend that it's a panacea and like a rose garden and everything is wonderful and beautiful. Whereas I tend to think of values as just be true to what you say you are. And that's all. That's, you know, don't judge, just get on with it. Yeah. Um, and then the, the second thing that I wanted to share with you is some, and again, I'd love to get your view on this. Um, so if we go pre-pandemic, everybody together a lot in the office, right? And what happened as a result of that was that because we're social animals, we developed relationships with each other and we collaborated better and we were more productive collectively as a team. But actually the organization and the leaders had little to do with that actually, because it was the people making that happen. So now fast forward, 
we've got a hybrid working situation. We're together less. And so those relationships aren't as strong as they were before. Collaboration is not as good as it was before, and potentially productivity is lower than it was before. Now, previously, the organization had no need to invest and lead the activity that was happening. But in the absence of what used to be, I think they now have a responsibility to put those things in place if they want to develop the relationships between employees and they want collaboration to be good and they want to increase productivity. But I don't see that happening in very many places at the moment. So it's yeah. to get your view on that. Well, let me just make sure I understand what you're saying, because I, I it's brilliant. So uh, culture happened by accident. Uh, and and the, the shared values that people felt weren't explicitly part of the organization, but they manifested in our personal relationships with the people that we were working beside next to. And, uh, and those relationships are really what drove productivity forward, um, despite the fact that it was you know, it was not necessarily uh, consciously created. It it just it, it just uh, emerged. It grew yeah. like a, a weed in the cracks of uh, uh, of uh, of the pavement, so to speak. Or a wildflower. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's let's move the flower is much better. I like that. <laughs> uh, uh, the um, uh, and now uh, because we don't have as many occasions to to uh to create those relationships we're, we're adrift and as a result there is the opportunity that companies have to actually consciously build a culture um yeah i think that i think you're right on i think that's that's really really very brilliant i had been looking at it more as a, a zeitgeist shift but you're right there is there's a change in format that has accelerated that as well um mm -hmm. and and i think though the uh, and but that is the great thing about taking I'm bringing it back to responsibility for your culture and creating it. It's not that we you know, and, and I think it's also fascinating this rush back to the office. Um, and I, I think that the uh, I don't know, the uh, the Zoom announcement that they're having people who are close to the office back two days a week. I don't think that that is as dramatic as people think it is. I think it's actually rather courageous of Zoom to say, let's try this. But I also don't think that you know it, it is necessary to have people together to have a, a great culture. You, know, you, you can do it virtually, but you need to be conscious about it. You need to take responsibility for it. And I think what are the rituals? that we have Definitely. like zoom happy hour and pizza parties is not going to work yeah it, it really needs how do we create rituals around you know from from the simplicity i'm i'm working with a, a a company doing an analysis of their culture and they talk about how and this is unintentional but how we start meetings just checking in with who who we are well, yeah, and what's going on? And they do it because they like each other, right? Yeah, yeah that's something that was was a byproduct of an existing good culture. Mm -hmm. Now, what but what companies need to do is they actually need to create those rituals. Absolutely. Some time at the beginning of a meeting to check in. What are you doing? Yeah, you know, how is is uh, you you mentioned that your daughter is sick? Is she better? Yeah, like oh, how how was your vacation? Be doing that publicly and and starting that meeting, looking at what and I think you know most companies don't really define their culture. They don't have uh, a defined purpose. If they do, it's really uh, an artsy mission statement. Yeah. And they don't have, uh, and they're, and, and even if they they have taken the step of identifying the values that lead to that culture, those two things often just sit on the wall somewhere. They're introduced in some marketing pieces and employee onboarding, but the opportunity to weave those into the daily, weekly, monthly rituals of uh, of uh, of the organization where employees are calling each other out. Did you guys see what Julie did yesterday? It's a perfect example of this value. Yeah, on to Julie. Evaluations in in our recruiting practices, in our marketing practices. Yeah, uh, these these are to highlight these things. It's a huge opportunity. Doesn't take much. Makes a huge difference.
So. Yeah, and when you say it doesn't take much, I kind of agree and disagree because, I, you know, it, it doesn't take much, but it takes a hell of a lot of hard work to be doing it all the time, every day, every person. And I'm sitting here smiling, listening to you, because what you're describing is, so th this um, 31 Practices is an approach I developed, which basically translates your stated values into a set of more concrete, observable behaviours which you then consciously practice in rotation. That's, you know, no more than 31 days in a month. And so, for instance, if uh, we work for an organization, let's say the value is excellence, today might be the practice we pay meticulous attention to cleanliness and tidiness. If I'm an engineer, when I go and check the boiler is working, I might sweep the plant room floor. If you work in the finance office, you might throw out the chair that's been in the corner broken for the last month. So everybody does something today focused on the practice for the day. And then the neuroscience of it, you can guess, is that through conscious repeated practice, the behavior becomes embedded. And then by definition, the values are alive. And I, the, I, I have a, a kind of signature phrase, which is that values are for living, not laminating because I think that really just sums up how it needs to be in organizations, but actually is not all, all too often. Um, oh, I'm loving it. Oh, and actually here's an, another thing in recruitment. So I've worked with organizations where they've said, oh, we wanna make our values a more part of the recruitment process, right? But what that sometimes means to them is they talk about their values, full stop, and that's it. So here's an example. Um, let's say Peter applies for a job to a company that says, we want to hire people that think differently because innovation is one of our core values, right? So you, you think that, that sounds good, so I'm gonna apply. And you ring up and they say, oh, Peter, what we'll do is we'll send you a hard copy application form. If you could fill that in in a couple of days and send it back, that would be really great. And it arrives, and it's a bad photocopy of a hard copy. So you're not exactly thinking innovation and fresh thinking right now, right? So they haven't reinforced their value at all. Whereas if you rang up and they said, oh, we've put you through this quick personality test, uh, you've made the short list, you're going to be interviewed next week. So what we'd like you to do is choose a place you really love being at, and we'd like you to spend $10 on making it a memorable occasion for the two of you. Now, there you're thinking, wow, nobody's ever asked me to do that before. That's real fresh thinking. So the, it's this thing about how do you actually manifest the, the values in the recruitment process to really get that home to the candidates? You're, you're hitting on something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think if we look at the, the, the research behind great resignation, uh, the quiet quitting, people are looking for two things, meaning, but then agency. And, yeah. and I think that there is a, a real opportunity there. I think, you know, and the application part comes from not a, a lack of desire to innovate, just an inertia of that's how we've done it. And so how is it that we can identify those opportunities to improve? Well, it's in that agency side and, and giving, creating tension. And I think values are a perfect structure to allow for uh, to cr the creation of, 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 of dissent structures, what I call. So if I can just share a story, um, I had a, 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 a temporary staffing firm and we really worked hard to take very, very good care of the people we decided to represent. And we did a tremendous amount of screening for those people um, and had some, some, some screening uh, processes that measured things that aren't normally looked at, things like adaptability and ability to follow directions and attitude toward work. Um, and we had some assessments that measured those things. And, we're, and we, we were very clear that it produced 
uh, a quality of person, particularly who's working on a consulting basis, that had those base skills that were necessary to be uh, a, a successful consultant. Uh, adaptability, you know, uh, recognizing not just doing it the way I think it should be done, but the way this organization needs it to be done. Um, you know, and a good attitude. You know, everyone gives the consultant the work that they don't want to do, and uh, you can't say, "Oh, that's not part of my job." That just doesn't work. So, you know, these are things that we looked at, and um, and but people wouldn't pass our screenings. And early on in my career, we would uh, tell them and they would freak out. So we would send them letters and then they would call us and scream you know, about the letters. And so, and I'm embarrassed to say, but I said, all right, we're just not gonna tell them anymore. And we started ghosting people, yeah. horrible, I'm embarrassed about it, uh, but it was well justified in my head. We, we don't have enough time to deal with all of this. And then something happened in the, the early you know, 2000s, Yelp came around. So our, uh, if aging myself, our, our, our reviews on City Search and Google were great because they were people who worked for us. Yeah. And they were, yeah, but they were also the type of person who's very focused. They're not writing a lot of reviews. They're writing very few reviews of organizations that they really, really appreciate where Yelp was optimized for people who write lots of reviews. Matter of fact, Yelp, if you do a one-off review on Yelp, it's never going to get seen. Yeah, you know, because Yelp just, you know, just thinks it's just a one-off and doesn't do it. Yeah. And so people who would spend time uh, reviewing their automatic teller machine and their you know uh, local cigar shop have much more influence than the people who just do one or two reviews. And guess what? We were ghosting a lot of those people and they hated us. So we went from having a five-star review on Google to a one-star uh, mm -hmm. review on Yelp. And it was causing lots of problems and I was panicked. And so my, my response is get more of the people who love us to write reviews, which was difficult, painful, and awful, but not fixing the core problem. Yeah. And I had this employee, her name was Becky, and she saved my life she uh, uh, recognized that the cause of those reviews is we weren't taking care of these people. Yeah. And, uh, and she said, we have to tell them. Mm -hmm. And what's more, she recognized that they're not upset because we told them, uh, but they're upset because we didn't manage their expectations beforehand. And I didn't see it. So I said, no, 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 we need to do it my way. And Becky looked me dead in the eye and she said, Peter, what you're doing is a violation of our core values. And right. at the time, I viewed her as an obstacle. Yeah. And I was like, well, fine, we'll do it your way. And when it fails, we'll do it my way. Well, obviously, Becky was right. And it was a key moment in my career and one that I am so grateful for because she was totally right. And immediately, the bad reviews went away. Immediately. Yeah, uh, yeah, and we told people and they didn't freak out. And the lesson for me was, and, and leadership for me, I really thought that I was supposed to be the guy with all the good ideas. So I was supposed to be the smartest one in the room. I, I'm, I wanna tell you, I am rarely the smartest one in the room. Yeah, but, and, but it redefined my understanding of leadership. My job is not to have the idea, but to create the space where the idea emerges and listen to those ideas in a way. But you know, from that point on, I really focused on, on making sure employees had a space to object. Uh, you know, and, 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 and there is not a better framework for people to object to decisions than values. Right. Yeah. You Cause know, it takes it out of opinion or, but yeah, you know, it is real. Yeah. You know, and, and I've since built decision-making frameworks based on values, you know, to really facilitate that because I want people to come up with that. So I think it is, is, and, and I think that's the opportunity of this time. The level of complexity in this world is overwhelming. There is no way senior leadership is going to understand all of the opportunities and problems faced in their industries. They must do so in collaboration with their employees in order to survive. And the organizations that figure that out will win and the others will go away. Yeah, and I think I think it's really, really critical. 
Yeah, and it we're we're veering into leadership here, and I, there's a, a few things again. So that um, the first thing is that I think leaders sometimes get mixed up between the end, which they are absolutely responsible for, and the means, which they sometimes get lost in and forget about the end that they had originally set out to achieve. So your story, I think, is a really good example of that, where you were trying to manage the process instead of remembering that you just need to look after these people. Um, and then you talked about how values is a great way to have those conversations. So with um, 31 practices, one of the benefits is that, it, you know, that example of excellence and cleanliness and tidiness, if the senior guy in the organization went into the boiler room on that day and said, Alan, I, I've been into the boiler room and I know that you checked it this morning, but it's really untidy in there. And today's practice is about cleanliness and tidiness. So why, why is that? Can you explain that? So it legitimizes that conversation rather than it become a personal affront from one person to the other, which is priceless. You know, it, it just cuts all of that personal stuff out. And it also focuses on the problem, not the person, exactly. right? Yeah, it's an opportunity for that person to say, well, you know, these systems are not working well, so I'm spending so much time fixing them that I just don't have time. Yeah, and, you know, and, and, but, and showing those, but also things like that. And what I keep thinking of is, uh, this is my home desk, uh, and uh, um, I used to share a studio with my wife. She's a, an artist, and okay. uh, I talk for a living, and she doesn't. So she kicked me out uh, a couple years ago, right when my daughter left for college. So I inherited her desk, but this is right where we hang out, just beyond here. So I associated the space with hanging out and relaxing, and it's kind of what I did. And I became much less productive, and uh, which meant I was working much more and miserable. So I started working in a co-working space, and I love the space. But what I love about it is the guy who runs it. It's a, a place called the Bond Collective. The guy who runs it, Francisco is a stickler for making sure that the place looks right. And I experienced this my first couple weeks there, I was giving a seminar. I like to stand up when I'm giving a seminar. It was over Zoom. And so I got a folding chair and I put it on top of the conference room table I was in so people could see the whiteboard I was working on. And Francisco, and he saw me setting up. He just said, I just want to come in and see. I see you have a table chair on the table. Is there something I can do to help you prop that up? Can I get you something else? I was very clear. He was saying, I don't like the way that looks. Yeah. <laughs> I recognize that you need it and that's okay, but I want to find a solution that works better. And you know, and so it really, you know, it it, it made a big impression on me on who he was. But also what I notice is as he walks through the hall, he picks up pieces of paper. Uh, same. You know what? Everyone in the organization does that. Yeah. Now, I don't see that happening. And I know for a fact that if Francisco didn't exhibit that behavior, you know, he didn't, if he wasn't visible for that value and being responsible for that value, the other people would not. Yeah, and right. as a result, I find myself picking up pieces of paper off the yeah. floor. I don't even work there. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind betting that he's ex hotels. You are completely right. He does have a background in the hospitality. There you industry. go. Yeah. yeah. And I find if I'm in a department store, I pick up the thread off the carpet, you know, it's like. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, and my work with the conscious capitalism movement, there is a. Uh, um, a private equity firm that really focuses on conscious companies. And one of the things that they do is they see, yeah, are people picking up the stuff off the floor or are they just walking by? It is a huge indicator. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's, this, this is the other side of the coin. There's a, a quote. Um, now, let me see if I can remember who these guys are. I think that it is Steve Grunert and Todd Whitaker. And I can't remember the book. But the quote that is famous that is associated with the book is that the culture is based on the worst accept the worst behavior accepted by leadership. And whilst I think that's absolutely true, I think there is a, a more positive opposite side of the coin as well, because Francisco 
sets the standard for his business by caring about how that chair on the table looks. Yes. I had a job looking after um, all of the services for a bank portfolio here in the UK. And one of the first things I did, it was a night cleaning service so that, that you know, due, overnight the, the place would be cleaned. So which meant that the lights were on. Um, and that's another story. But the windows all had blinds. And when I first arrived, I just had a look around the building and they were all at different levels, all crooked. Now, what does that say about your organization? You know, so one of the things that we put in place was when you go to the floor, the first thing you do is put the blinds straight. And we had a certain distance up that they had to be. And that was it. And then the other story is from New York, actually. Um, so I was working with Barclays Capital, again, in the facilities management um, division. And we had a tour of the basement and back of house area. And I have never seen such a clean back of house area. And the guy who was responsible for it was just so, so proud of his space. Now, here's the thing. Every single screw was horizontal. The head was horizontal. He showed us. He said, you can choose any screw in here that you like, you know, in a plug socket or anything screwed to whatever. Everything horizontal. Wow. Wow, that is that is a that is amazing, and and the effect of that, right? That I mean, it is it is you know a, a simple thing, but it it yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting uh, what you're saying about culture is what we tolerate, um, and I think that there's a real clash in that at this current time. You know, is that you and I are trained to put up with bad behavior from people above us. Yeah, yeah, and and I think when when we hear these phrases like "oh, this youngest generation, they don't they don't want to work," no, they will not put up with being mistreated. Yeah, and 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 that is an opportunity, right? Yeah, that is a huge opportunity. Yeah, it is, and but is viewed as uh, these young people they're so entitled. But no, 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 this is an opportunity for us to grow as leaders. Peter, yeah. I think you said right yeah. because it certainly when we were well, when I was, I can't speak for you obviously, but when I was growing up, the some of the leaders that I would meet uh, abused their position, right? And I think what you're saying, and I, I agree with you, is that the the younger generations are smarter, savvier, braver than I was. And quite rightly, they won't accept that. And I guess yeah. that's a great thing. Well, and I, I not only did I witness it, I participated. I was definitely one. I, I was definitely exhibited behavior. I don't think I was the worst of them, but I was far from the best. And it was that pushback. And, you know, and I had some life experiences that had me start to look at that pushback and realize, oh, that's that's on me. That's not them. And uh, and to be able to to recognize that has been one of the greatest gifts of my life is to 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 be able to to uh, and I really like your frame. Culture is what we tolerate. That's great. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not uh, about that. And it's not also static. Right. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. You know, and the, the that tension, you know, is uh, and how we accept that conflict and how we deal with that conflict is part of of how we allow our culture to grow um yeah and i think that please please keep in mind so that the, the tolerate piece i i absolutely agree with that but i think the important thing for me is that there is a more positive opposite side of that coin which is about culture is also what you are willing to strive to be in place yes. all of the time and so that guy with the horizontal screws the impact of that like you've said when i used to be in hotels if i was walking through the bar i wouldn't leave a cushion that was out of place i would put it in place and then the knock-on impact of that is that everybody starts to do that and you don't have to do it all of the time now I'm I'm just conscious I can't believe this time the time has just flown. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> it has. And we so we, we're gonna wrap it up with a final question, which is this. What are you encouraged to do differently about responsibility as a result of our conversation? 
Uh, this has been a great uh, conversation. And I think um, uh, it's so perfect that this has come up because I, I think um, starting a new business is incredibly hard. And I'm creating a new business in a new category. So it is, it is hard in areas that I haven't imagined. And, um, and, you know, I, I don't have the benefit of, uh, of the European education system. And uh, my daughter is, uh, has a very, very expensive uh, education habit, which as you're starting something new is quite terrifying. Um, and, and so what I'm realizing now is this is an opportunity for me to go deeper into, into the, taking responsibility for that um I, I i i'm realizing that oh i started to look at this as a burden um and uh and you know and but really what it is is an opportunity yeah you know, my yeah you know, to to really push through uh that and to use it to 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 fuel this this uh little bit of momentum that i'm having now and to increase it and it is not out of a burden of paying for the school but rather a commitment that i have to the great experience that my daughter's having and my commitment to really change this horrible structure of recruitment that is failing everybody. And to, to really look at that challenge as if I am opening a, a beautiful gift. That is, is, this was a real reminder of that. And I'm very grateful. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you for that. So I'm gonna do two things. One, I'm gonna look up that, um, you know, the quote about um, the, the worst behavior accepted by leadership. I'm going to look up um, that book and send you the link um, in case you're interested to have Please a look do. at it. Um, and then for me, I think I'm, so you remember I, I mentioned how I'd done some work with organizations about manifesting their values in the recruitment process. Um, I'm not doing very much of that actually. And it's kind of, you know, sometimes when people aren't asking about it, because they don't know about it, you it kind of goes into the background and maybe disappears. I'm going to bring that forward because it is so valuable and I think it should be of so much interest to people at this time. So you've helped me to identify something that was kind of disappearing for me. So thank you for that. My so pleasure. Peter, brilliant conversation. Our values jam is done. Thank this you. This is so much fun. Really, really was a highlight of my day. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, take care.